back to the uh, second session of today's talk. Uh, uh, I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Ryan Bennett uh, from University of California in Santa Cruz. He's currently Associate Professor of Linguistics in the department. His uh, uh, dissertation is also from University of uh, uh, California, Santa Cruz, UCSC. Uh, he mostly works on formal phonology and also interfaces with all other areas of linguistics, as his website shows, interfaces with syntax, morphology, and phonetics. So, uh, and he also has, uh, have, uh, um, uh, has been working on uh, a number of languages in the field, uh, including Irish, Mayan, and also the language uh, that he's going to talk about, Uspanteco, today. Uh, uh, so, Let's welcome Ryan uh, to the second talk of today's uh, lecture series. Okay. Can everybody see the slides? I can see it. Okay. Um, thanks. So thanks very much for having me. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, vowel deletion and some other um, phonological uh, patterns in Uspanteco, uh, which is a Mayan language spoken in uh, Guatemala. Um, if you're not particularly familiar with Guatemala, it's this small little country here to the south of Mexico. Um, for reference, uh, if you are in the United States, it's about the size of Kentucky. Uh, if you are in Japan, it's about the size of the Kanto region. If you're somewhere else, I don't know what benchmark to give you, but that's about the size of the country here. Um, and uh, despite its kind of relatively small geographical limits, um, it's linguistically quite rich. So there are still something like 25 distinct Mayan languages spoken in Guatemala today. Um, and in fact, it's a majority indigenous country speaking both English. So Uspanteco is one of these languages. Um, it's spoken uh, in the central highlands of Guatemala in the, uh, the town of San Miguel Uspantan, which is this town behind me right here on Zoom. <coughs> Speakers of Uspanteco. Um, the issue right now is that children in traditional Uspanteco speaking uh, towns um, are typically So there are lots of interesting things about the phonology of Uspanteco. One thing which I'll mention just briefly, um, because it, uh, for the way that it interacts with vowel deletion, is that it's the only Guatemalan um, um, more or less like the kind of lexical pitch accent system that you find in Tokyo Japanese, for example. So uh, uh, under our analysis, there is a class of words which are lexically toneless like the word uh, tulul uh, on the left, um, as well as a class of words which are lexically specified for a high tone, uh, as you can see on the right, uh, for the example, my dog or uh, inti. Um, I, I should also say I can play any of these examples for you later if you want to listen to some Uspanteco, but for time I'm going to skip over. I'm playing the recordings right now. <clears throat> so tone is um, relevant uh, uh, to the extent uh, for the, pres uh, the current presentation, uh, because it interacts with stress placement and stress placement interacts with the patterns of vowel deletion I'm going to talk about. So um, with respect to stress placement in this language, uh, so this is a language that has both lexical tone and stress, uh, there are two basic patterns of stress placement. So the majority pattern is simply to put stress on the final vowel of the word. So this occurs uh, in words that have final short vowels, and final long vowels, and also words that have um, final long vowels specified for uh, a high tone. Um, vowel length is contrastive in Uspanteco, uh, but long vowels only ever occur in the final syllable of the word, which is something I'll mention uh, uh, later on. The second uh, pattern of stress placement uh, uh, has stress falling on the penultimate syllable rather than the final syllable, and this pattern is phonologically predictable. So it only occurs in words that have a lexical high tone, and which also have a short vowel in the final syllable. So we have analyzed this uh, as uh, the interaction of two basic principles. So first, 
Um, there's the principle that tone and stress must always coincide on the same syllable in Uspanteco. That's an exceptionless generalization about the language. Um, and, but there's also a very uh, robust generalization I'll talk about again in a moment, which is that high tone never falls on the final mora of the word. It always falls on the penultimate mora of the word. So if you put those two restrictions together, if you have high tone and a final short vowel, the prediction is that you should have high tone uh, and stress co-occurring on the penultimate syllable rather than on the final syllable. And I'll also point out that um, this diagram here for the word uh, imba, uh, my head, is a good illustration of the fact that um, tone and stress are phonetically distinct in Uspanteco. So the primary correlate of tone is pitch, uh, but the primary correlates of stress are intensity, duration, and uh, vowel quality. And you can at least see in the waveform here that the stressed uh, penultimate syllable is uh, longer and louder than the unstressed final syllable, as we would expect. So um, in earlier work on the accentual phonology of this language, uh, we argued that uh, stress assignments in uh, uh, final uh, position and penultimate position is determined uh, within a metrical foot in Uspanteco. So one reason uh, to believe this or one reason to suspect that this might be the case is the very simple fact that stress is limited to a two syllable window. It's always final or penultimate. And you can make very quick sense of that if you assume that uh, there's always a bisyllabic foot at the right edge of the word that determines the possible locations for stress assignment. So in cases where you have final stress, you can straightforwardly analyze these as involving iambic footing. Um, since long vowels only ever occur in final syllables, that means the only kinds of iams you would get will be light, light iams or light, heavy iams which is what we would expect from uh, the typology of um, uh, quantity sensitivity and iambic foot cross linguistically. Now for penultimate stress, there are a couple of different uh, analytical options we could pursue, but as I mentioned, uh, the analysis that we uh, adopted back in 2013 was to say that um, penultimate stress involves a flip in the, the kind of foot you have rather than a movement in the position of the foot. So when you have penultimate accent, you have trochaic footing rather than um, iambic footing, which gives you uh, stress and tone on the second to last syllable. So just to give you some concrete examples, um, we have teacher, which would have an iambic foot and final stress. If we add a plural suffix to that word, which introduces tone, we get a prosodic reorganization and you get uh, with tone and uh, uh, stress on the penult uh, corresponding to trochaic footing. Now, one key piece of evidence that we use to argue for this foot-based analysis of um, accent in Uspanteco comes from the pattern of vowel deletion that is my focus for the presentation today. Um, so the first observation with, uh, regarding vowel deletion is that when you have final stress, there's a particular position in the word which sometimes undergoes vowel deletion. And that position is the position immediately preceding the final stress syllable, which I'll call pretonic position. So in this position, vowels can delete, but they don't have to. So you get um, alternations like chikach, uh, but also chikach with deletion of that pretonic e. Now, um, we know that this isn't just across the board deletion of unstressed vowels, because if we look at longer words, you can see that it's really specifically that pretonic position, that vowel preceding the stressed syllable that is selectively targeted for deletion. That's the position that's within the word that deletion cares about not other positions um, uh, closer to the beginning of the word. Um, just to give you some uh, data points that um, illustrate this, so this is the word for um, she or he plays the marimba, which is kind of a, it's a kind of xylophone. Um, um, here we have a speaker who produces this word without deletion on this instance. Um, here we have the same word produced by a different speaker, and you can see that they've deleted that vowel. So there's no evidence for uh, that underlying O between H and M uh, in this example. Now, the key observation for the foot-based analysis of accent placement is that when you have penultimate accent, when accent falls on the second to last syllable, the position that's targeted by vowel deletion flips as well. It shifts. So it's no longer the case that pretonic position is selectively targeted for deletion. Now it's post-tonic position that's selectively targeted for deletion. So you get things like in chikic, alternating with in chik, with deletion of that post-tonic uh, e in the example for my basket. Um, just to show you some other examples, again, here's the word for um, my tomato, uh, impish. Uh, here you can see that the post-tonic vowel is um, not deleted, but we have the same item produced by the same speaker in the same recording session, 
And in this case, that vowel was deleted. So there's no trace in our waveform here of that underlying vowel at the juncture between the pa and the sha in this example. Oh, my transcription is incorrect. Sorry about that. So the reason that we thought this provided some good evidence for the foot-based analysis of accent uh, placement was that you get a, if you use foot structure to um, uh, state a descriptive generalization about where uh, vowels are deleted, you get a very nice, clean, consistent, symmetrical generalization. You simply say, deletion targets the unstressed syllable within the foot, whether that foot is trochaic or iambic. And that's what's responsible for giving you the flip in the position of the vowel that's deleted uh, relative to the position of stress. We thought that that was um, generalization is much harder to capture if you don't use foot structure or if you use a different kind of foot structure to produce the um, accentual variation we've seen. Um, however, even back then, there was something that was always nagging at us about uh, our analysis of vowel deletion, um, which was we were never really sure whether it made sense to think of deletion as really involving deletion in the classical phonological sense uh, of you know, eliminating a vowel symbol in the categorical abstract phonology, or whether deletion was um, you know, being a kind of variable and optional process was really something that uh, might be better characterized as an effect of phonetic implementation, or at least as a process that was closer to the surface uh, than a kind of uh, traditional symbolic phonological analysis. So just to give you a sense of the kind of thing I have in mind when I talk about uh, the, the um, phonetic alternative, let's just think for a second about the fact that when we produce sounds, in particular when we produce constrictions for consonants, let's say, but also for vowels, um, those constrictions have an extent in time and space, right? So it takes a while to move your articulators to the right place to produce a particular um, segment, and uh, that movement takes place over time. So for example, what we're looking at here in this diagram is uh, Emma data showing us um, vertical movement of the tongue tip in the time course of uh, forming a constriction for uh, S and Z in Japanese. And you can see that there's a phase at which the tongue tip is raising to the alveolar ridge. There's a phase at which the constriction for the S and the Z has been achieved and is uh, being maintained or sustained. And then there's a phase following the release of that constriction, right? So that's what it means to say that constrictions exist in space and time when we're talking about phonetics. Um, and this is relevant because there are a number of um, variable and optional processes uh, out there in the literature that have sometimes been characterized as not really involving, again, symbolic phonology, but involving something about uh, changes in the relative timing of constriction formation that give the uh, impression of a phonological process when we're really dealing with something that's more phonetically oriented. So a classic example of this is a word final TD deletion in coda clusters in English. This is an optional or variable process that gives us alternations like west side versus west side. And this process has a number of characteristics which make it look different from at least the kind of uh, canonical phonological processes we tend to teach our undergraduates about. So it's variable, it's optional, um, it's sensitive to extra grammatical factors like speech rate and speech style. Um, the application rate, so the odds that this process will apply, is sensitive to the, the segmental environment in a very fine-grained way that um, cares about the place and manner of the flanking consonants. And so all of this, again, might suggest that we're dealing with something that's a bit more phonetic than really um, properly uh, phonological. And so following up on this intuition, there's a very well-known paper or series of papers by Broman and Goldstein from the um, early 90s investigating this question uh, by means of articulatory phonetic evidence. So um, what Broman and Goldstein did was look at um, x-ray pellet tracings, uh, which show us the movement of different articulators over time in much the same way that we were just looking at for Japanese S and Z, um, in phrases like perfect memory, where um, TD deletion could occur. And so what they found was, if you look at careful speech, uh, and you look at renditions or productions of phrases like perfect memory, you can see that the uh, time course of constriction formation for the K and the T and the M, uh, those constrictions are pretty well separated. They're pretty nicely sequenced. So you, know, you, you get an opportunity to release the T in kind of an audible way um, before the constriction for the M is really formed. But in faster speech or casual speech, uh, those constrictions are heavily overlapped. And what we can see here in particular is that the constriction for the M is formed and sustained before the release of the preceding T. And if we think about uh, the, the um, 
the organization of the vocal tract, we can understand what's gonna follow from this kind of coordination pattern. So if your lips are closed for an M at the point when you release a constriction for a T, you're not gonna hear the release of that T. And so auditorily, that will give you the impression that the T has deleted, even though we can see from the phonetic record here, the T has not deleted. The T is present in this person's production. You just can't hear it. So this is an argument that uh, we're really dealing with a phonetic uh, pattern uh, uh, involving gestural overlap rather than, again, a classical categorical symbolic phonological pattern. Um, this is pretty different from some other patterns, uh, phonological patterns, that we might really want to think of as being uh, abstract and symbolic. So consider, for example, the deletion of N in word final um, MN clusters in English, which is responsible for giving us alternations like uh, dam versus damnation. Um, this process is completely insensitive to speech rate and style. It applies obligatorily and consistently. It's not a variable process. And it's integrated into other aspects of the grammar in, the way that, in a way that suggests it's phonologically controlled. So famously, um, you over-apply deletion uh, before um, level two inflectional suffixes like ing, so damning instead of damning. And so all of this, again, is more characteristic of really uh, classical phonological processes rather than a more phonetically oriented uh, pattern of gestural overlap. So coming back to Uspanteco, um, what would our options be here? Well, um, if uh, gestural uh, overlap is, is the right explanation for why we see vowel zero uh, alternations in Uspanteco, um, that means that deletion should look something like this, right? Deletion should involve uh, high, um, should involve the encroachment of the neighboring consonants on top of the intervening vowel in a way that hides the articulation of that vowel, even though the vowel is still present there in the phonological representation. On the other hand, if we're dealing with true vowel deletion, that vowel should just be absent by the time you get to phonology. There should no longer be a, rec or, excuse me, by the time you get to phonetics, there should no longer be a categorical symbolic representation of the vowel at that level of uh, production. So what I'm gonna do now is go through some of the arguments um, in favor of treating deletion and uspanteco as a phonological process. For reasons of time, I won't go through all of them. I'm also going to, then gonna talk about some of the arguments in favor of treating it as a more surface-oriented phonetic process involving gestural overlap. And then ultimately what I wanna suggest is that um, it's both. What we're looking at is a pattern of phonologically controlled gestural overlap during speech production. Um, and there's all sorts of things that I won't have time to talk about, like the formal implementation of that idea, but I would be happy to talk about in the question period if people are interested. So um, the first piece of evidence uh, we think that um, deletion is really phonological in character um, comes from the ar argument, or at least the assumption, that deletion interacts with foot structure. So foot structure seems to be a very good candidate for something that is part of the abstract phonology rather than something that's merely a fact about speech production um, or speech articulation. And so again, to the extent that deletion cares about foot structure, that makes deletion look like it's part of the phonology. Um, there's also a certain amount of phonotactic sensitivity uh, that we might think is characteristic of phonological processes. Um, so uh, in particular, deletion is inhibited uh, between identical consonants. So uh, for example, in a word like uh, susun, which is a kind of snail, you can never or almost never, which I'll come back to, um, delete the first oo, so you can't get things like soon, um, even though that oo is in a position that would normally be targeted by deletion. Right? So it seems like what we have here is a phonotactic condition, um, a ban on adjacent identical consonants, for example, sometimes called false geminates or false geminate avoidance or anti-gemination, which is blocking deletion from applying in a context where it would normally apply. Um, there's another class of phonotactic restrictions which um, have a similar flavor, uh, which um, uh, the, well, I'll just mention the first of them. Um, so one thing we see is that you never get deletion of vowels which are underlyingly word initial in this language. So the word for stone is a uh, and you always have to produce that initial a. Uh. You can't syncopate it and say ah. Uh. Um, this might also be reducible to consonant phonotactics um, because in Uspanteco and other um, Guatemalan Mayan languages, words that are underlying the vowel initial get produced with an epithetic word initial glottal stop. So in these cases, if you deleted that initial vowel, you might end up deriving uh, an initial glottal stop consonant cluster, which is otherwise impossible in the language. So this could be another instance of phonotactic blocking. Um, and in fact, in word final position, you see an exactly symmetrical effect. So you never get deletion of vowels for word final uh, glottal stop in, a, in words like inca, uh, 
um, even when those vowels are otherwise eligible deletion, uh, eligible for deletion. And that might be exactly because deletion here would produce a final consonant glottal stop cluster, which is otherwise not permitted in the language. Another really, really, really striking fact about deletion in Uspanteco that it was, became salient to me basically as soon as I started working on this language a decade ago um, is that deletion is completely insensitive to speech rate and style. It occurs in formal speech, it occurs in slow speech, it occurs in fast speech. It does not seem to interact with speech rate and style in any way. Um, and in fact, I'll point out that um, syncope or vowel deletion is often represented in writing in very formal documents like um, dictionaries, for example. You can find uh, vowel deletion applying variably within a dictionary, even though that's a highly um, formal document. Um, so I'll give you an example of this. Um, here is the word for dry, uh, um, Here uh, we have this word being produced with a vowel, uh, underlying vowel intact. This was in a very, very formal elicitation task. Our speaker was speaking very slowly and very carefully. Uh, here's the same word produced by the same speaker less than a second later, and the vowel is gone. The vowel has been deleted, even though, again, this was a very, very formal elicitation task. Um, there's also a, a certain sensitivity to morphology, um, similar to the sensitivity we just talked about for final end deletion in English, which might again suggest that deletion is, is really properly construed as part of the grammar, uh, the phonological grammar. Um, so specifically, vowels never delete in prefixes in this language. So to say I left, you say she know. You can't say schnell with deletion of that uh, prefixal e, um, even though sh n is a perfectly fine word initial cluster in this language. So this cannot be reduced to consonant phonotactics. This has to be um, uh, due to morphological conditioning. This is very, very different from roots and suffixes, where you see deletion happen all the time. Deletion is just completely rampant in other morphological environments and completely banned in the prefixal field. On the other hand, like I mentioned, um, there are some reasons um, to think that uh, deletion really involves uh, uh, gestural overlap uh, at the level of speech production rather than uh, something more abstract and categorical and symbolic uh, that we might, again, assign to the, the phonology proper. So first, there's the observation that I began with that kind of made us, sent us down this road, which is that um, deletion is a variable process. It's optional, both within uh, the speak, uh, speech of individuals, but also between speakers. And maybe more compellingly, um, deletion is also tightly connected to a process of um, vowel reduction, so vowel shortening and vowel centralization, which very, very suspiciously occurs in exactly the same environments that deletion occurs in. So I'll just illustrate this for you. So um, here we have the word for flower, kutzech. Uh, here you can see that the unstressed vowel in post-tonic position is somewhat reduced, but it's not particularly short. You know, it's about 60 milliseconds. Um, this is actually not the, the, the kind of typical production of this word. A much more typical production would involve more dramatic reduction of that post-tonic unstressed vowel. So now you can see here it's been reduced down to 20 milliseconds. It's quite brief. Um, and if you know, we follow this logic, if you keep reducing this vowel in this context more and more and more, what are you going to end up with? You'll end up with nothing. You'll end up with deletion as effectively the, the gradient endpoint of a process of reduction that occurs in post-tonic position in words that have a penultimate accent like this one. Um, so again, to the extent that we think reduction is really a surface-oriented uh, gradient phonetic process, that makes deletion look like a more surface-oriented phonetic process as well. Um, and now, I mentioned earlier that um, deletion does seem to be phonotactically conditioned, uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of evidence that deletion does not care at all about consonant phonotactics in Uspanteco. Um, and that's because deletion very, very regularly produces consonant clusters that are highly marked um, both from the perspective of Uspanteco, so that is clusters that don't independently occur in the language, but also typologically from the perspective of things like sonority sequencing or feature delivery. So you get things like we've seen already, like chik uh, where we have a sequence of voiceless obstruents. Um, you get things like shiken, where you have a uh, apparent reversal of sonority sequencing. You get um, approximate approximate sequences, like in the word yesterday, iwr, and so on and so forth. Um, again, to the extent that we think the violation of these um, otherwise robust phonotactic restrictions is more indicative of a phonetic process, this makes deletion in Uspanteco look kind of like a phonetic process too. 
Um, now, while we're talking about um, uh, phonotactic restrictions, it's true that the phonotactic restrictions that deletion cares about are very, very robust generalizations about when deletion can apply and when it can't. Um, however, um, the ban on uh, deleting a vowel between identical consonants is not exceptionless. So it's very, very rare to find an example of deletion in a word like wafik, where we have an E between two identical um, uvular fricatives. But every once in a while, very, very rarely, you do come across examples that look like that. So you do find cases like ach, where we have a long ch here that um, seems to indicate we have deletion of that underlying E. Uh, again, this might um, indicate that whatever sensitivity to phonotactics we're seeing here is gradient rather than categorical, and maybe that too um, should be taken as being more characteristic of a uh, of phonetic process involved in um, speech articulation rather than the phonology. Um, another observation which actually troubled us um, many years ago when we started working on this is that deletion uh, interacts opaquely with tone placement. So you'll remember that there's a very robust generalization about where high tone occurs in Uspanteco. It always occurs on the penultimate mora of the word. It always occurs on the second to last mora, except when you have um, penultimate accent and deletion of the final vowel. Because what that then derives in an example like inch, uh, my tomato with vowel deletion is a case where it seems like we have high tone on the final mora of the word in violation of that otherwise exceptionless generalization. Um, but of course, whether this is really an opaque interaction here or not depends on whether we're dealing with an actual process of vowel deletion or a process of gestural overlap that's simply hiding the vowel rather than deleting it. And just again to um, give you, contextualize our thinking here with respect to some patterns that people have discussed for English, um, think about um, the deletion of schwa in English in uh, phrases like I suppose to I suppose. So this is a process, um, this process of vowel deletion and schwa deletion is characteristic of casual speech and fast speech in English, and it interacts with consonant phonotactics in an opaque way. So um, if I say I suppose with deletion of schwa, you'll notice that the P is still aspirated in I suppose, even though normally we wouldn't have aspiration of P in uh, that environment in a word initial SP cluster. So deletion here is um, uh, essentially counter-bleeding aspiration in an opaque way. Um, we also get clusters like um, potato, a PT cluster, as the result of schwa deletion, which are not um, uh, characteristic, or in, in basically they're ruled out otherwise uh, in English. Um, and so this kind of opacity, uh, this opaque interaction between deletion and consonant phonotactics is somewhat analogous to the opaque interaction we're seeing here between vowel deletion and, and tonotactics in Uspanteco in a way that might suggest we're dealing with a phonetic process in Uspanteco as well, a fast speech type process, although as we've seen, um, speech rate doesn't really matter in Uspanteco. Um, so to try to address this question, um, we might follow in the footsteps of Broman and Goldstein and try to use instrumental phonetic evidence to investigate the question of whether we're dealing with articulatory overlap between uh, adjacent segments or really a categorical abstract symbolic process of vowel deletion. Um, so um, as it happens, we happen to have some articulatory phonetic evidence for Uspanteco. Um, so we were interested in some other aspects of Uspanteco phonetics. And as a result, we carried out a, a study, a general study on Uspanteco um, using electroglottography to try to investigate some questions about voice quality in the language. Um, if you're not familiar with electroglottography, it's a pretty simple uh, methodology in some ways. So the basic idea is you put two electrodes on either side of the larynx and you run a very, very weak electrical current between those um, electrodes. And uh, what this does is it gives you a very direct measure of um, certain kinds of vocal fold activity. So whether the vocal folds are vibrating or not vibrating, for example, um, because when the vocal folds come together, you get a spike in the electrical signal between those electrodes. And when the vocal folds come apart, you get a dip in electrical signal between those electrodes. So it's a, it's a very useful technique for measuring vocal fold um, activity uh, without um, interference from whatever is going on in the oral tract, for example. So why was this useful for our circumstances or our present question? Well, if deletion or quote unquote, vowel deletion in Uspanteco really involves gestural overlap, then we might find some cases where we look at the audio recording and we can't see any evidence of the vowel. 
we think that the vowel has been deleted. But when we look at the electroglottography signal, we see some trace of voicing associated with the underlying vowel that tells us at the level of phonetic production, the vowel is in some sense still there, even though we can't necessarily see it or hear it in the audio signal. It's still being articulated in some way by the speaker, just like the T in perfect memory was hidden in casual speech uh, in the auditory signal uh, in English, but could be detected by instrumental means. Um, so uh, what we did is we took a bunch of um, examples in our recordings where it looked like vowel deletion had occurred between uh, two voiceless consonants. So here's an example where it looks like we had a lexical vowel that was deleted between voiceless k and voiceless h. And then we asked, when we look at the EGG, do we see any voicing in this environment? Because if we do, we know the voicing can only be attributed to the underlying vowel because we're looking at an environment where the consonants are voiceless. So any voicing we see in the electroglottography must be a reflex of the underlying lexical vowel that we thought was deleted. And it turns out that in a good number of the examples we have, that's exactly what we find. So we find electroglottographic evidence for brief periods of kind of weak attenuated voicing uh, 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 corresponding to the underlying lexical vowel that seemed to have been deleted uh, when we just looked at the acoustic signal. So um, for reasons of time, I won't look at this chart, but the point is we have lots of examples like this. That's, I didn't just show you one example. There's a, a good chunk of examples that behave exactly like that. Um, so we think that this is a pretty um, compelling or at least pretty suggestive evidence that deletion in Uspanteco really involves a high level of gestural overlap between uh, consonants and uh, a vowel uh, in between those consonants. However, at least to my mind, this actually, this observation or this finding, it doesn't undermine a lot of the arguments that we presented previously that deletion is part of the phonology. It just doesn't bear on the question, actually, for some of the diagnostics we use about whether deletion is phonologically controlled or not. So, I mean, first of all, there's a the very basic fact that um, deletion or this pattern of deletion is part of the sound system of Uspanteco. You have to learn to speak Uspanteco in this way. You have to learn uh, the, the intricacies of this pattern of deletion. It's not, um, even the neighboring Mayan languages don't have exactly this pattern of syncope. So to the extent that, that we think, you know, learned knowledge uh, should be equated with phonology, that makes it seem like we're dealing with a phonological process. But there are also all of these other um, finer grain diagnostics that are really suggestive of a phonological process too. So um, even though some of the phonotactic sensitivity that deletion shows has exceptions, the phonotactic sensitivities are still very robust. So there are facts about consonant phonotactics that seem to block vowel deletion as gestural overlap. That kind of looks like phonology. Um, there's still the fact that deletion, the position targeted by deletion is conditioned by foot structure. That looks like phonology. There's the fact that deletion is sensitive to morphology in a very um, clean categorical, um, but also fine grained way, which again, I think is more characteristic of uh, grammatically controlled processes. And there's also the very striking fact that um, it is not, this is not conditioned in any way whatsoever by speech rate or style. Um, so um, I think the conclusion here, which I'd be happy to talk about in more detail, is that um, deletion is phonologically controlled gestural overlap. Um, I will just flag, in case there are people in the audience who are interested in this question, that um, this is actually very, very similar to what some people have said about high vowel devoicing or high vowel deletion in Japanese. Um, which I don't have time to talk about um, at the moment, but could talk about in the question period. Um, so I will just um, stop there uh, and say thanks to my collaborators and the speakers who have um, taught us about Uspanteco, and thank you guys. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so if you have any question, uh, please uh, send uh, your name and affiliation uh, to Sung Hun Lee, uh, in case if you can't find my spelling. So that's what you can do. Uh, we have one question already waiting. Uh, Yuna E from uh, Seoul National University, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it very much. And I was just wondering why um, the vowels delete, uh, don't delete in prefixes, but in suffixes the deletion occurs quite frequently, you said. So I, um, I was curious whether you had some thought. Yeah, it's a good question. Why. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was my question. 
It's a good question, and I, I don't have an entirely satisfactory answer to that question yet. I can tell you mm -hmm. some things that won't help in trying to understand mm -hmm. that pattern. So um, it's not um, a distinction between inflectional morphology and derivational morphology, for example. So mm -hmm. suffixes tend to be derivational and prefixes tend to be inflectional, um, but, mm -hmm. but you get deletion in inflectional suffixes also, so it's not that kind of morphological split. Uh -huh. um, it, it's also, I don't think, um, evidence that uh, prefixes are um, less well integrated with the stem than suffixes are. So we know that there are many languages, including English, but also many languages cross-linguistically, where prefixes seem to be phonologically more distant from their stems. They don't interact very much with the phonology of their stems when suffixes do. Um, but that won't work here because the prefixes we're looking at seem to be very closely integrated with their stems, so they do participate in other kinds of phonological processes um, in a very like systematic expected way. Um, that's true for Uspanteco, but also for all of the related languages. So I, I don't think prosodic integration or phonological integration helps us much there either. Um, one idea that my collaborator Robert Henderson had, which is really just a hunch, it's not really a proposal, um, is that um, prefixes are, uh, or I should kind of how to phrase this, in roots and suffixes, you sometimes get morphological behavior that looks non-concatenative or looks more like root and pattern morphology. Um, but in prefixes, you get exclusively concatenative morphology. And so maybe there is something about that distinction that's relevant, but I, I myself, I don't know exactly how to make that connection yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next question is from John Kingston, UMass Amherst. Hey Ryan, hey John. can you hear? Can you? Hi. Um, so if the what appears to be deletion is phonologically controlled uh, gestural overlap, shouldn't you always find EGG evidence of that vowel, even that if is a the? Question. And I've been I've, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. So um, one thing I didn't mention is that the data I presented was from one speaker. Um, mm -hmm. I have partially analyzed data from another speaker, and that speaker never has. Um, the EGG, uh, those, that kind of hidden vowel in the EGG signal that the first speaker has. And I think there are a few different ways we could interpret this. So one possibility is that, um, you know, when you have two voiceless consonants and you're flanking a voiced vowel, if those, the laryngeal gestures associated with those consonants are really, really aggressive, you might think they could just completely obliterate the voicing gesture for that uh, intermediate vowel in a way that just essentially functions like deletion, but without involving symbolic deletion and the kind of pre-phonetic yeah. uh, abstract phonology. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there, there's a, something very suspicious about this that I, I'm trying to understand better, which is that if you look cross-linguistically at phenomena like this, um, so even look at um, Shigeto and, and Jason Shaw's work on um, Japanese high vowel uh, devoicing and deletion, you actually often find patterns like this where for some speakers, it looks like they delete categorically and other speakers mm -hmm. tend to reduce or some speakers tend to go back and forth between deleting categorically and just reducing. And you find this for um, patterns of um, uh, intrusive vowel intrusion mm -hmm. uh, and whether or not that's, that intrusive vowel seems to count as ep epithetic or not. You find it for vowel deletion. You find it for patterns of nasal place assimilation. And so there's work by Ellison Hardcastle looking at this. So some speakers seem to have categorical nasal place assimilation. In English, other speakers seem to have gradient place assimilation. Right. And so there, there's something, I think, deeper here about why we get certain kinds of variation and certain kinds of bimodal distributions of categorical outcomes versus non-categorical outcomes. Um, but again, I don't quite understand why the world looks that way yet, unless um, what we're seeing is kind of the phonologization of a gradient process in real time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Next question comes from Kanan Bryce from UCLA. Hi, uh, thanks for this talk. This is really, really cool. Um, I guess my, my question is a little bit like John's in that like among the the contexts where you find the EG evidence for the covert vowel, um, is there, is it always there or is that itself variable? So, I have a follow-up question based on that. Uh, 
So un unfortunately, we, we have pretty limited data. So I, I'm, I'm hesitant to draw conclusions that are too strong. I can tell you there is a pattern, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second. I mean, I think for my perspective from the framing of the overall problem here, the fact that you ever find that EGG data is telling. Um, but, but I think that the, the actual like, fact of the matter about what the empirical landscape looks like is a bit more complex and you know, we have to address those complexities. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, in the speaker whose data I showed you, you always get um, these kinds of hidden vowels, these covert vowels in uh, final derived word final clusters that involve a stop or an affricate followed by a fricative. If you have a combination of two stops or, or, or a stop and an affricate, you never find these kinds of hidden vowels for the speaker. So there are lots of ways we could try to think about this. So one possibility is the aerodynamic conditions that are created when you put a stop and a stop together are different from the conditions when you put a stop and a fricative together. Um, and we know fricatives have their own aerodynamic requirements. And so maybe those aerodynamic requirements are such that you can have a hidden vowel when you have a fricative they just simply can't, or the speaker cannot produce it when you have sequences of stops. On the other hand, you know, maybe there's something more deliberate about it and something that we might think of as being more phonotactic in character than aerodynamic in character about the kinds of clusters that are being derived. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not, you know, quite sure what to say about that. I mean, one of our, one of the things I would have been doing a month ago was collecting a lot more data of this type to, to try to address exactly these questions. But it's, it's, I agree. I mean, one wants to know what the facts are here a little bit better and understand why they look the way they do. Cool, thanks very much. Thanks. Yes, uh, so I guess we don't have uh, any question, but also time is kind of up. Can you unshare your screen, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, the rest of this session will proceed in this uh, in the following way. We will have a short wrap up of this session. Uh, there's there's some announcement that we want to make, and after that, uh, instead of having a breakout room, we are going to stay in the main room for any further discussion. Uh, if you are interested in doing. So that's basically uh, uh, how we're going to proceed. So thank you all for those who are participating here. And I thank uh, both Ryan and Kanan for giving a great talk. Uh, it was the first uh, uh, two talks of the first uh, series of uh, 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 the events that we are planning, uh, uh, that we have planned uh, for, uh, for the next uh, two months. Uh, the next uh, series will be, get, uh, will be held in two weeks on Wednesday, the same time. Uh, it will be 10 a.m. From, uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Japan Standard Time. And in the second uh, series of the talk, we will have two exciting talks. Uh, uh, the first talk will be delivered by Kayla Lampton Miller uh, uh, at SUNY Oswego, and she's going to talk about In Search of True Word Level Recursion. Abstract can be found on the website. Uh, the second talk will be delivered by Harin Kwon from uh, George Mason University, and she's going to talk about beyond phonotactics, perception of non-native consonant clusters. So uh, uh, her extra can also be found uh, on the uh, uh, series website. So I welcome uh, you all to join us uh, also in the next uh, talk. But before that, uh, we have an exciting uh, we have exciting news about. Uh, uh, our plenary speaker for this series, and Shigeto will briefly uh, uh, introduce them. So yes, uh, we are very pleased to announce that Barbara Patti is going to give a plenary lecture on the history of formal semantics. And she is going to focus on uh, the interaction between linguistics, philosophy, mm -hmm. and logic. And as I made an informal tweet yesterday uh, about it. Um, phonetic, not phonetic, sorry, logicians and philosophers in Japan really excited. So um, it's the, the topic is a little different from phonetics and phonology. Uh, we are going to look forward to that event. Yes, and that event is scheduled on July 4th, uh, Japan time. Uh, uh, the time is not 10 a.m. It will be 9 a.m. Japan Standard Time. Uh, so that means 8 a.m. for Eastern, uh, 8 p.m. for uh, 8 p.m. before uh, the Independence Day, uh, uh, July 3rd uh, uh, in the Eastern, and uh, 5 p.m. on 
uh, Pacific time. Uh, for this event, uh, since we are expecting some uh, other participants, we have separate uh, registration required. So if you'd like to attend the plenary event, uh, please uh, uh, re-register for that particular event. Uh, I'm sorry for making you register all the time, but uh, that's uh, it just uh, how it happens. So, okay, uh, thank you so much to all. Uh, like, and this event was possible uh, uh, thanks to you, of course, but also we have uh, important two people uh, who uh, managed uh, the running of this work uh, uh, talk series. Michinori uh, Suzuki from uh, ICU uh, and Migiwa, uh, uh, Migiwa Sang from <laughs> uh, who is also from ICU, uh, who uh, basically uh, made sure that uh, we have all the uh, uh, logistics uh, for this uh, uh, talk series ready. So let's thank them as well. So thank you very much. So I guess uh, those who want to stay uh, uh, a little bit uh, longer, please stay and then we will continue with the discussion. And those who need to leave, thanks again uh, for joining this event and I hope to see you all in two weeks. Bye.